people think that they find God, but they don't. He finds you. And he was slowly but surely um, putting me in a box and taking these things away that I thought were um, fulfilling my life. And even to the point where, you know, the toys were great, um, but the power of running a boardroom, the power of giving a, 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 a speech or a presentation to a hundred or hundreds of, of guys and everyone looking at you like, man, this guy, look at this guy. You know, people say, man, you, you are the, this guy's great. Everyone will record me. My tapes were all over the street. Um, and everyone was, oh man, Clancy's the best. And I've been, like, yeah, I guess I am. I'm the best. Yeah, of course I'm the best. The problem with that was there was, kind of like a hole like here this is the way I look back on it. And no matter what I put in here, the Porsche, the model, um, the toys, uh, the boat, penthouse, the trips, private jets, no matter what I put in here, it wasn't enough. The drugs and the drugs got worse and worse. Um, it just, you just, not fulfilled and you, you're just going for you, what's the next, you know, hot thing I can try to fill this void in my spirit with. Right. But you don't, you know, you don't recognize it, but that's essentially what's going on. And, um, and meanwhile, what God is doing is stripping me of my, um, pride. Because people tell me I'm the best, and I, you know, if anybody told me that today, they wouldn't. I would not take that. I would not tell. I would not take that compliment. But it did so well for you. I know. This is a special interview for me, and most people would think it's special for me because of your position as a CEO of a business. But why this is so important, this is very special for me, because I remember when I first started a prayer group, and I, I was, I, you know, I'm constantly lost chasing business, chasing life, and what it's supposed to be. And, you know, I don't have that person that could tell me exactly how it's supposed to be, which a lot of people wish they had. I was so inspired. The fact that you were running a prayer group and your son was sitting right next to you. I was like, this brother must have to figure out like, like he's the CEO and this tight and all these things. You shouldn't have, you didn't have one conversation about all these accolades or anything. It was really your focus was God. And what God has done for your life. And the fact that I saw your son sitting right next to you, I think he figured it out. Because it, I was inspired by that. So today I have John Clancy. Did I pronounce it right, John? That's right. Um, John, the title is the CEO of Planet Fitness Midwest. That's right. What is the CEO of Planet Fitness Midwest? What, and so there's Planet Fitness and there is Smoothie King. Yeah, Smoothie King, Plan of Fitness. And closer the mic for me, please, John. Sure. Smoothie King, Plan of Fitness. Um, we also uh, run uh, and operate a Buff City Soap, which is another franchise. And then we have a real estate portfolio. So it's Midwest brands, but under Midwest brands are all those brands. And then there's Cornerstone, um, Cornerstone uh, Properties, Cornerstone Communities, which are housing, multifamily, Cornerstone Properties, which is uh, the real estate that's that we use to, uh, to operate our brand. So we, we own a good portion of the real estate as well. So how I want to go start from the beginning, like I do in all the shows. Mm -hmm. Born and raised where? Massapequa, Long Island. Massapequa. Born in Brooklyn. By the time I was one, my dad had us out of the boroughs. He was an NYPD cop uh, and didn't want to bring his kids up in Brooklyn. So... Moved us out to the boroughs. I was one. My sister was 
four at the time, and my mother was probably pregnant with my little sister, Donna, at the time. So your other sister is your older sister? Yeah, my older sister. sister. Yeah, yeah, she's three years older than me. So you're the only boy in the house, well, you and your father. Well, then I, then seven years later came my younger brother who okay. lives in New Orleans and is getting married in three weeks and he's seven years younger than me. So he's 50 before he's 49 now. So how was it growing up with your brother and sister, your, your father being a cop and your mom, what did you, your mom stay at home? Housewife. Yeah. Housewife. How was that experience growing up? I had, you know, I had a pretty kind of I idealistic kind of childhood. Uh, had a great father. My mother was amazing. Um, we lived in a safe place, Massapequa, Long Island. And, uh, you know, I mean, mom and dad were great mom and dad. Great, great parents. Great, great parents. Um, not so good as spouses. Uh, that marriage was uh, kind of like a fiery car wreck that you see and, you know, I right, don't right. have to look at it, but you don't really want to look at it. It was just a disaster. But parenting. Great. So, you know, for you to say your father was a great dad, um, what examples did, he, you know, what, what makes you say that? Of my, course how he raised you, but. Yeah, my father, uh, even before I met Christ, um, uh, molded me into the man I am today. And obviously Christ took that to a completely different level and, and in a supernatural way. But my father always told me no matter what, and I was not a good student and I wasn't a good I know, athlete. I, know I was a terrible athlete. I, I had uh, dyslexia, ADD before they even knew what that was. Um, so I was a poor student and I was a worse athlete. And in Massapequa, uh, the, the way people judged you, uh, so, you know, from a society standpoint, a you know, kid's hierarchy kind of thing, was if you could play soccer or uh, lacrosse, those are, you know, the real, you know, if you could do that, then you could make it. You as can make a, it anyway. You can make it, right. You can get girls, everything, the whole thing, right. But I was just a terrible athlete. And my father uh, always told me, you can work hard, you can accomplish anything. If you put your mind to it and you work hard, you can accomplish anything. You can accomplish anything. And this was in the face of his father never doing that. So he broke that curse and he knew if I instill this in my son and my, my sisters too, and my other brother, if I instill this, then I'm going to give him a shot to be the best he can possibly be. And he did. He, he, I remember distinctly on so many different occasions when I failed, he said, you can do it. You can do it. And he, t to the point where he became my soccer coach, I was the worst player on the team. It was not even close. I was terrible. <laughs> I was the worst athlete. I was just, I'm just uncoordinated, right, right. you know, from probably, you know, third or fourth grade all the way up until seventh and eighth grade, you know, just getting cut from every team that he wasn't a, a coach. And then finally I just, you know, he just said, work, 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 work. And that's what I did. I worked, I kicked the ball against a, a fence for you know, hours, four or five, six hours. I would just, just, completely obsessed with not sucking at soccer. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and because of that, um, I eventually became a, a, an accomplished soccer player and played for, you know, one of the top teams on Long Island at the time, big high school and then played all through college and, and became a, you know, a real soccer player. Uh, but that's just one thing because he said, you can do it, you can do it. And, and I, and I, I realized, man, if I work at it, I can do it. And this is, with the background that I was bad at everything. So I could, now I could go to college and I could work at being good at school and that worked. And I was a good student at school. So he laid that foundation for me. My mother, pure love. Amazing. Just, a mo just, you can never do wrong. Can never do wrong. She was just pure. She was pure love. An incredible, um, early and her mother too, early Christ-like figure in my life. Um, her mother was uh, the first picture of Jesus that I had in my life. Even though I didn't know Jesus, I looked at her and I said, that woman's amazing. She was incredible. And she was, you know, a Christian, probably the only Christian besides really my mother. Cause my dad was, you know, he was not, um, uh, he was, he was working really hard and, coaching us and, you know, co even coach my sister and my brother. And, um, 
he was he just didn't have that kind of soft soft that soft side that but he mind, was building your he was, mindset he and was, everything else he was building a man is what he was doing and and my my mother filled in that other side that you know soft that side balance. yeah it was yeah i got I was blessed growing up. Let's just put it that way. I want to. I want to talk about the mindset, though, because it sounds like your father instilled that work, grind, that hunger to want more and to be better. Do you believe he was the foundation of that mindset? Yeah, no doubt, absolutely. I I was not like him though. Um, I never wanted to be a cop. I never wanted to be a fireman. I, I wanted to be rich, even when I was really young. How? Why? I don't know. I don't know what started it. Um, I always wanted a Porsche. I wanted a model girlfriend. I wanted all these like things. Even when I was relatively young, probably fifth, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade, you know, the picture of the Porsche in the room, telling my mother at that age, I'm going to be a millionaire. She must've been like, what is <laughs> What's wrong with this what kid? The heck? I even walked into the dime savings bank when I was, probably in junior high school. Um, and I tried to get a real estate loan because I read a book. I could, how I could buy a real estate with no money down <laughs> as a kid. And I sat down with a bank lady and she's just like, I'm sorry. But, how old do uh, you think you were in? I was, I was probably in seventh grade at the time, maybe six, maybe sixth hey, grade. Another love with you. I just like walk like my mom was walking around. Wow, I'm like, let me go to the <laughs> bank and see if I can get that. My I read that book. I'm, like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to rock and roll. I want to be a millionaire. So do you, so do you believe the information that you receive around that time is what made you wanted more? What made you want more? I think it was the the I think it was the the toys. I, I would see like a guy in a, in a Porsche, or I would see uh, like a really nice house, and or something on TV. I'm sure, and I think. Yeah, you know, my lifestyles are rich and famous. Remember that one? Yep, absolutely. And I'd look at that and I'd be like, man, I want that. Mm -hmm. how, how do I get that? And then I got my father in my ear, you know, meanwhile, I'm bad at everything, but my father's telling me, you can accomplish anything, you can accomplish anything, giving me that, that positive influence that I need to overcome the reality, which was at school being made fun of. And because, you know, I'm going to special classes and, um, you know, not being a good soccer player. So let's just say I wasn't popular. And it was kind of, it was, if I didn't have that, what my father gave me, there's no way I'd be where I am today. So he instilled the mindset 100%. He instilled the mindset. And your mom instilled the love and the balance that you That's needed right. growing up. God used them both separately for, in their own ways. Absolutely. And do you believe your brothers and sisters all have that mindset? No. Why no. do you believe you got it differently? I don't know. I, I my brother's more like me, you know, he's aggressive. He's, he, he's a successful executive. Um, my sister chose the nurse route. Uh, my younger sister, my older sister, I mean, they're, they're, they're all successful, but I'm a nut, you know, it's like, I'm just, but I'm just unique in, in a way that, um, you know, can get you in trouble and, Sure, we'll cover some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's it's unique good, unique bad, minus Christ. It could be really bad. Wow. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm sure we'll talk Absolutely. About, about some of so that. Le so growing up in that community, did you go out to school, college, you know, after high school? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I graduated high school um, by the skin of my teeth. Um, but, you know, I became... A, a pretty good soccer player, you know, for, for, you know, that area that w was really, uh, we had one of the best soccer teams in the entire state of New York, big, big high school. Wow. And, um, you know, I, I played for that team, which was a, which was an accomplishment that mm -hmm. if you would have told anybody that that was going to happen when I was in fifth or sixth grade, they would have bet you no a way. thousand to one. It wouldn't have happened. Right. No way would that have happened. In fact, one of my, um, one of my elementary school gym teachers by the Mr. Daniello, that was his name, Mr. Daniello, who slammed me down on a mat when I was probably in fourth grade because I, my mom said, you should go out for the wrestling team. You know? <laughs> Must have been 50 pounds soaking wet. This was a bad idea. And I went into this room with the mats and everything. And he said, Clancy, get over here. And he took me, slammed me down. And I 
screaming, crying in front of the kids, everyone making fun of me. And just like I ran home crying. And, but when I walked off the field in my senior year playing for that soccer team, he actually was a coach, was a gym teacher in the high school. Wow. And he pulled me over. He goes, Clancy, I never thought you could, I cannot believe what you accomplished. It's just, he's like, I'm just so proud of what you accomplished. And, you know, that meant a lot because when he slammed me down on that mat, man, I hated that guy. So you had the memory, you had the trauma of him slamming you down. You're like, this guy's the worst thing ever. You know, I hate him. But the last, end of your senior year, he was able to impact you still by telling you, you got it. That's right. That's right. And and I'm I'm sure when he slammed me down on the mat when I was a little kid, I'm, he was doing it to toughen me up because I was, I was weak, right? So he's like, I'm going to toughen this kid up. Um, so I, I, I think I, I hated him with the wrong, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it was Yeah, no, but it's a feeling that it wasn't, you weren't excited about seeing him every day. No, especially when I was young. Now, when I was in high school and I, uh, I was an accomplished mm-hmm. player, it was different because I had the respect and Absolutely. so it was different than seeing him. But when he came, came over to the, on the sideline and told me that, I thought to myself, wow, I really did do this. Wow. wow. I really pulled it off. Was that some of your first um, feeling of accomplishment? That was, yeah, it, it, yeah, because you you know you you get attracted to the girls, you know, see the, you know, you felt uh, that Porsche coming. I felt that Porsche coming. My <laughs> girlfriend was beautiful, and I, I just like I I arrived, you know, for a high school kid. How important I is arrived. high school sports? How important do you believe high school sports is for children? I think it's very important. I what think, does it do? What do you and Maybe believe? it's not always sports. It could be the chess club. It could be activity. some, yeah, some kind of competitive activity that uh, initiates a work ethic and um, uh, initiates uh, a, a wanting to strive to be good. Great. Maybe even uh, I, I, would, I dare to say, how about that? Great. Absolutely. And I think that's, that that's good for children. It was so, great for me. I know that. Did it come? Did you change that over into college? You play college sports also. Yeah, I played soccer in college too. Yeah. How was that experience? It was great. The first two years, I went to a junior college because uh, I was a very poor uh, student. Mm-hmm. I cu- I couldn't get into a, a four year college, and uh, we were a nationally ranked team, and uh, it was you know it was great. It was a relatively small campus, a, a SUNY school, State University in New York, upstate New York, and it was. Uh, a lot of fun. I was, you know. How proud was your father around that time? He used to come to my games. I was the captain of the team. I was uh, a yeah. leading scorer, one of the top players in the, in the His league. His work paid off. His, he, was pr- he, was, he was proud. He was like, you know, and you really did it. Was he still a police officer then? Uh, yeah. Pr- at that point, um, yes, he was still a police officer. He retired when I was probably in the workforce for about five or six years. So you said something that was, I think was so important. I don't want you to talk a little bit about it. That they both were great parents, but they had difficulties with each other. Mm. How did that affect your house? It, it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Uh, so much to the point where when they were divorced, they got divorced. They they told us they sat us down, and I remember thinking, you know, this is great. You know, most kids would be like, oh my goodness, I love my father, but I mean, I couldn't I couldn't watch it anymore. It was very stressful for me. I took it probably worse than anybody. My older sister, she would comfort me. My youngest sister, she took it just almost as bad as me. And my brother was too young. He just didn't get it. Um, but it was, it, it was bad. It was real. it was really very, very stressful for me. Um, I stopped, what was so stressful about the divorce? They, the, it wasn't the divorce. It was the fighting that led up to the divorce. Mm. Let me give you an idea, Beethoven. When my guidance counselor called me in and said, we need to talk. I want to counsel you through your parents' divorce. I looked at him dead pan in the face and I told him there's no counseling needed. This is one of the best days of my life. Because my father told me, I'm going to see you no matter what. And my mother said, your father loves you. I love you. We're just going to live separately. And you're going to see your father just as much as you did, you know, because my dad was a hard worker. He's getting up. He went to Harvard while he was in the police force leading up to this, driving back and forth from 
I mean, he worked hard and coach somehow pulled this all off and coached me in soccer. Mm. So it, it's not like I wasn't going to see my father and I was assured of that. And, and that actually became a reality. I saw my father just as much probably as I did when we lived with him, but I didn't have to live with the anxiety of my mother and father constantly fighting with each other. You so know? you knew you were going to be freed from seeing that. So that was why you were excited. Correct. Wow. And they were much better. How old were you at that age? I was, uh, I was in 10th grade, ninth, ninth or 10th grade. It was the beginning of high school. So you were in high school. Yeah, um, 14, 14 15 ish. And the, why did you take it so hard? Is it the separation? Is it the anxiety of what might happen? And why was it so hard for you? The, the actual divorce, the divorce wasn't hard. The divorce was good news. It but was, it was really just a separation of what you what you thought it was going to be. It was it, for me. I wouldn't have to see them fight anymore. I, I still could be coached by my dad and still have a good relationship with my dad. And my dad would be happier. My mother was happier. They just weren't happy with each other anymore. And still, great parents. Great parents. Great. I mean, they got married when they were kids. You know, they they. they, they, they Yep. Uh, my mom got pregnant with my, with my, uh, with my older sister and that's it. And they were married. And you know, the, the stress of being a cop in the seventies in New York mm. city, that's intense. That's no joke. Yeah. And it, it, it took its toll on the marriage and you know, it's, did it, they get remarried? Um, uh, my dad did. Yes. Your dad got remarried. My mother never got remarried. She, yeah. she died tragically at 50. Yeah. Wow. That's hard there. So now you're out of, um, you're in college. You're still have your supportive parents. Um, you get into work in, in work field now. Like what, when you went to school, what did you actually go to school for? I went to school for business. And then I. Why I, business? Because I want to be rich. <laughs> one plus one equals two. Huh? <laughs> it was, it was really that simple. So you, really in your mind, you're too. like. I want to be rich. I'm going to school for business. Yes. I'm going to figure out this business thing. I'm going to own a bunch of real estate. And, and my So did you see that growing up? Yeah. You know, you, you see, uh, you know, guys like Trump, I'm from New York. So mm -hmm. I see, you know, Donald Trump, Hey, he's a real estate mogul and, and, and others. And you just like, wow, man, that, that'd be really cool to be rich. And, and, uh, you know, live in Palm beach sometimes in New York, sometimes this, you know, like, so you did know. you already have that Palm beach? I want to live in both markets. Yeah, beach? I had that. I want to live in Manhattan. I had like, you know, go to Hawaii and Europe. And, Your mind and, never sat still. It was just, you know, I knew the cars I wanted. I knew what my girlfriend was going to look like. Uh, I knew I was going to have a penthouse. I was going to eventually have a yacht. I was going to all these things. Like I just knew I wanted. And, I mean, really, probably the, the truth is probably at that point, I knew they were I, they were more like hopes and dreams than they were goals and realities. But when I started reading Napoleon Hill, um, I realized that I could really do, I could get this done. I could actually do it. I could write my goals down and I could identify them. And then it became really exciting because it was just almost like it was a matter of time. What, what in that book that made you lock in when you started seeing it? I, it was just the stories of people that like me, regular people that didn't come from anything were able to employ this goal setting techniques, this image imagery, um, and, uh, and, and accomplish, you know, amazing things. So I just, I bought into it essentially. When did it click? When did it all start coming together? Probably like right, right around like maybe eighth, between eighth and ninth grade, me and my friend, Matt, we would really study the books and just say, you know, wait if we did this. Minute, I'm thinking you're talking about when you were in college, you started reading. No, 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 no. I, I how read, did you get a book like this in your hand at eighth grade? Uh, how did I originally get Think and Grow Rich into my hand? It was me and my friend, Matt. We both wanted to be rich. And we just heard about this book. I think it was his idea. And I said, we got to get this book. We went to the library. Uh, so back then, you know, it was basically the library, right? There was, there was no Borders books or anything like that. 
<laughs> so we went to the library and we took the book out and um, we read it and we wrote our goals down and I said, oh, this is going to be great. You know, my goals back then as a, as a kid going into ninth grade was, you know, have a hot girlfriend, um, you know. <laughs> the play, hot girlfriend play. was super important. Oh, John. big time important. You know, play on the, the you know, the A team, the A master, you know, play for Burner High School. You know, it was like, like very, you know, simple kid goals. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't like, you know, drive a Porsche because just how am I going to drive a Porsche? Not yet. 14 years old. Right? Right. <laughs> so, but, uh, there may have been a picture of a Porsche too, or a mansion in that, in that original goal book. I think there probably was, mm -hmm. was definitely in my head, but, um, yeah, so that was so, young. So after you read the book, you started actually manifesting these things that you put your mind to. Yeah. Um, when did it all click where it started actually? So you got out of, well, out of college, did you get right into business or while you were in college, you got into business? No, no. Uh, it's a great, it's a great question. It's going to start things that really got crazy. Um, so I graduated college in 1989 and there was a pretty significant recession and the job market was pretty tough. And the reality and embarrassingly enough is Beethoven, I could not get a job. And I either was one of two things, the worst interviewer of all time <laughs> or just not a good employee that anyone would ever want probably a little bit of both. And, um, I should have read an interview book. I think now thinking back. On it. <laughs> yeah. Must've been, you already terrible. wanted to be the owner. So I don't know how it's going to work. Must've been terrible. And you know, in hindsight, like I, I told someone today, uh, um, when he said, uh, well, maybe you come, you could come and, and work for me. Or I said, no, I, I am the worst employee right. ever, ever. I, I couldn't be told anything. I was terrible. Always got fired. Um, but yeah, so I graduated uh, college and I have this nice fancy finance degree and I think I'm going to go out and get a job. And the reality is I couldn't get one. Um, and this was 89. So I was getting turned down for jobs at, you know, 12 grand plus commission. And even it got so bad after six or eight months, I went to all commission jobs and tried to get just a sales job, cop selling copiers, insurance and stuff like that. I couldn't even get those jobs. Mm, kind of. The last, it was bad. The Amen. last, it was so embarrassing. The last interview I ever went on, it was in Massapequa, my hometown, before I got a job as a stockbroker trainee, uh, was uh, as an insurance company on Hicksville Road in Massapequa. And I remember this like it was yesterday. When the interview was over, the guy looked at me and just said, listen, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to call you back or anything. I'm, I'm just going to cut straight with you. I think you'll appreciate the honesty. I said, great. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take the honesty. And I'm thinking to myself, here we go again. Mm -hmm. And he said, look to me, he goes, you know, sales isn't cut out for you. You're not cut out for sales. You're not a salesman. I did. He goes, I just know it. And he's got the suit and the nice suit and he's the boss. Right. So I'm walk out and I'm like, I guess sales isn't for me. Within a week of that interview, I met a friend of mine that I played uh, soccer with when, as kids Mass Pequa. His name's Bob Koch. And Bobby was out at a bar and we were all having some fun. And I got like my five bucks in my pocket, broke, no job. You know, you gotta hold on. Girlfriend from college about to break up with me. It's just, just, you know, just, I'm, I'm like this, like the chart, you know, the graph going down right, right, right. and it's going down hard. You know, Absolutely. I had my fun in college and I was, you know, big man on campus for a while and everything. And then reality I, hit. I was realizing no cash, no fun in life. And I was broke. And when I mean broke, I was broke, 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 broke. broke. Cause my dad was rebuilding his life after the divorce. Mm -hmm. My mom was living on, you know, alimony and, you know, you know she, was, she was, she was uh, a waitress and, you know, working two jobs. She had no money for me and I, I didn't come from money. So it's not like I, I had any, income coming in. So I'm, I'm just surviving and you working. didn't miss anything you didn't have. Oh man. It, I was Beethoven. You were broke. <laughs> broke. <laughs> right. No car, no money, no nothing. Mm. Um, and Bobby, um, you know, I've got my, you know, one or two beers and you know, and that's, you know, that's it. I got no money. And Bobby just, uh, pulls up to the bar and takes a wad of cash out of his pocket and ding, 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 ding. Uh, it could, it looked like a million dollars to me. 
it was probably you know hundred bucks in singles. Yeah, it doesn't it, matter. It was yeah, it was it was it was hundreds though, right? So you know, as a as a whatever a twenty two year old broke, I whips out like a stack of hundreds. It, it was at least two or three thousand in hundreds, and um, I said, "What the what?" He's like, "Glancy drinks are on me tonight." I'm like. Say no more. What are you doing? How did you get this cash? And Bobby was known to be, you know, good, 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 good kid. Went to St. John's, graduated. He's known to be a little bit of an exaggerator, mm-hmm. but the, the cash don't lie. Cash don't lie. Don't no. lie. Right. So he's like, I'm working as a stockbroker at a place called Stratton Oakmont and I'm making a, all sorts of money and, and you'd be great. I'm like, that's all you need to hear. I'd be great. I haven't heard I'm that like, in a while. I, I haven't heard that. I've been, I've, I, everyone telling me I suck for the last year. Right. So I'm like, Bobby, man, get me an interview. He's like, John, done deal. You'd be so good. You know how to hook up with girls. You got a good rap. You'd be a great <laughs> stockbroker. So the qualification for a great stockbroker. At Stratton Oakmont. Yeah. You could hook up with girls. <laughs> You'll be great at this. Yeah. I should have take the interview. I, you know what? I should have known right then and there. Maybe, <laughs> well, I, but the, ki- was, the cash. The cash and, did everything. And and broke, you wanted to be rich. For a broke kid, you know, it was survival. And I want to be rich. So I'm thinking maybe, you know, this is it. This is it. So uh, about a week later-ish, I show up to the front door of Stratton Oakmont at 1979 Marcus Avenue in Lake Success, New York. Mm-hmm. And I walk through a parking lot that, looked like an exotic car showroom. Mm -mm -mm. I couldn't believe it. I was like, it must be a bunch of old men working here or something. There's no way people my age are driving these cars. So I walk in, I go into this big boardroom. They sit me down. I said, Bob Koch got me an interview. Hold on a second. Put me in this room and this conference table probably... 15 person, you know, kind of conference, big, big conference big table. I'm sitting there. I'm like, what is this going to be about? So guy comes in, sits down with me, one end of the ta- conference room, the other opposite ends. And he says, so Bob Koch says that he thinks that you'd be a good stockbroker. What do you think? Uh, I think I could be a good stockbroker. Bob says he could be, I think I could be a good, I could be a good stockbroker. He goes, yeah, let me ask you a question. Would you shovel S H I T for 150 grand a year? I looked at him and I said, What? He goes, I asked you a question. I said, Yes, I would shovel S H I T for $150,000 a year. Yes. Gold shovel and everything. And he said, Okay, Clancy, Bobby likes you. You got the job. Let me show you the boardroom. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So yes. How many interviews you failed before then? Before that? At least 40, maybe 50. Bro kid hangs out, see an old friend that he plays sports with. Old friend said, you'll be perfect for this because you could. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And this is one of those times. So Kenny takes me um, to the front of the, the side entrance to the boardroom where the brokers enter. um, And he opens up a door, double doors to a room that is approximately the size of a football field with rows of desks, almost as like for an interior space, it seems like as far as the eyes can see. And this is the Wolf of Wall Street. Yes. Hundreds of guys in suits. Most of them, he has the thing, in their 20s. I mean, there's some older dudes in there, but most of the guys are in their 20s, early 30s. And they are dressed to the nines with watch. This is your first day? This was the day I was interviewed. They brought me in because this is their deal. They want to show their. This is what's actually happening. This is, yeah. Th- they want to show um, you know, the new guy, hey, this is, what, this is what's up. So I walk around the room and it was like. Um, it's like a scene from like Goodfellas, you know, when they they go around the bar. It's right. Like, it's like, yeah, this is Cliff Schaffman. This is Elliot Lowenstern. This is this they guy. They said this everybody's last guy. name. This is Scanlon. This is this guy. And I'm like, what the? I, I, 
you know, the, the Rolexes, the Armani mm. suits. And, this is right where you belong. Uh, that's what I, that's what I'm saying. Offer, like, I'm this like, is, this you, is you've it. been talking about this is eight, when you're, since you were eighth grade. Th this is it. And I'm like, I can, I, I got to do this. I, can I be have rich. to do this. And it was right then and there as I, as I was being walked around the boardroom and introduced to people, I said to myself, I need to be a producer. I need to be one of these big, big producers in this room. And once I do that, I'm going to have these suits, that watch, that car outside. And I'm sure the beautiful girl that goes along with it. And I was obsessed from wow. that time on with being rich and being a successful stockbroker. Do you believe Bobby, what's his name? Bobby Koch. Bobby Koch telling you you will be great at this was the 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 impact that you needed to go into that interview and to make it was become a, successful it was the confidence i needed it was, it, confidence. It was the confidence it was also desperate like you know uh, it was like first time i ever and i'm gonna be good at anything in quite some time mm. you know what i'm saying it's like i even because you had your ups and you're going back down yeah 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 i was going back down and i was going back down pretty fast, pretty fast. It, it was not, it was not pretty. So I needed, I needed the, that, um, that confidence. And, and once I got the confidence, well, then I got into the, what they call the meat grinder, which is the reality of working at a Stratton Oakmont in 1989. And what, what does that, that look like? That looks like you getting in the office at seven fifteen, seven thirty, And if you're late, you're fired. And you pick up the phone and you dial minimum 200 dials a day and you're calling the richest people in the country and you're trying to get them on the phone through their secretaries, qualifying them to be potential Stratton Oakmont investors. Uh, that's, you know, maybe sounds easier than it actually is. You need to be good at this. Otherwise you quit or get fired really fast. So I'll give you an idea. They would hire a hundred guys and within a week, 50 were gone. Most just walked out because they couldn't handle it. They would get screamed at. We would be screamed at and called pond scum and M or F for losers and just top of the lungs. If you put the phone down on the receiver and it was the middle of the day and it wasn't, you weren't going out to lunch, you were taking a chance of getting fired. You had to hang up with your finger, next, finger, next, finger, next, finger, next. If you went like this, unless you had to go to the bathroom, which I didn't, th I don't even think I did. You had I no touch for that. Six months, I was scared I was going to get fired. Uh, you know, to deal with the bathroom at lunch and in the morning. It was a meat grinder. So out of those hundred people, 50 are gone in a week. In a month, 75 are gone. In six months, the hundred that were, that were hired, there's 10 left. Only five of those even get to the point where they take their test. Only half of that five, two and a half, but we'll just round it up to three, actually pass the test. And to be a producer, the first hundred, you don't even have one. You got to hire 500 to get one producer to get a producer the size of that a kind of broker that I was. You got to hire like, I don't know, probably 2000. Wow. To get to the point where you're making seven figures. Wow. It is, it's a numbers game and it was a, it was a meat grinder is what it was. And the training was incredible. Like I mean, all about sales and training. From Napoleon Hill, the stuff I read when I was a kid, right, mm -hmm. um, to how to work your way around a, a secretary, to how to speak with uh, in voice inflection and sincerity, like things like this. Napoleon, believe me, this is the best thing I've seen in six months. Mm -hmm. You hear the voice inflection and the pause for emphasis? All those things. Training. Training. And now it's like, I know it inside and out. I'm going to do it in my sleep and I'm 56. This is 30 plus years ago, but it's, I could do it in my sleep. Uh, it I was instilling you. That's it was instilled. It was instilled. So 
you go into the training program and, and, uh, you know, you look to take your test, uh, in six months, hopefully it took me probably closer to 12 months because Bobby was smart. He wanted to keep me on as a cold caller and I was a damn good one. Mm. <laughs> and then, then I passed my test and then I got to open up accounts for him. Did you already start making money? No. You're making, uh, back then, let's see, it was, uh, 150 bucks a week or something like that. Enough to take care of the bare minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Enough, enough to get in and out, but I was broke. I mean, I was showing up with dockers and like, you know, ripped pants and shirts, but that were just unacceptable. When I passed my test and I actually got on the phone as a stockbroker, um, I, I immediately started opening accounts. I mean, my first, a few cold calls I was choppy on, but it was pretty it was known pretty quickly to me and others, this guy's got talent, which made the guy who interviewed me and told me I couldn't sell wrong, which was interesting. Mm. So um, I was uh, pretty- so, One second. The reason I'm <laughs> cutting you off at this point, because I'm realizing something. People said you're not cut for it, but the moment somebody believes in you, you lock in. You did it with sports. Yeah. Fourth grade, you weren't good enough. By the time you got to the point from your father telling you, you great, you lock in. So the moment Bob believed in you, you locked in. Yeah. You true. know, that's what I've watched consistent. You it's know, they're hearing the story right now. Yeah. It's true. And the more people would tell me that as they heard me pitch on the phone, the more accounts I opened up. And it didn't hurt that I was probably one of the hardest workers and hundreds of people I would get in at seven o'clock and I would work until 10, 11 o'clock at night. I was doing that work stuff that, that, that work um, style started from what your father instilled from the beginning. hundred percent. They said, you got to make 200 calls. I said, well, since I'm dyslexic and I got a learning disability, I got to do 400. So everything that they said, you got to get 10 pictures off a day when you pass your test, you got to get 10 pictures to open one account. So I was like, all right, I'll get 20 off. And what happened was because God gave me the talent, I never knew I had, obviously. Um, so I would get 20 pitchers off and open three or four accounts you know, on some days. Some days I'd strike out just like anything else, a numbers game. But some days I'd open three or four accounts. And if you open three or four accounts in a day at a Stratton Oakmont in 1990, it's like, all right, we got a potential Derek Jeter here. You know, it's, it's holy crap. Mm. This guy's talented. And because I was working the time zones and what that means is at night late, I was pitching Hawaii, which is six hours behind. So you could pitch Hawaii at 10 o'clock at night and it's 4 PM. This guy, right? So you just, you know, and those people aren't called as much because generally people tend to be lazy. So no one's working at 10, 11 o'clock in New York, generally speaking. So I kind of cracked the new code and built a book really quickly. Um, and, you know, the combination of the talent and the hard work. I went from a broke kid, walked into Stratton Oakmont, goes, Bob, bought some drinks for me at, 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 at the bar <laughs> to a kid that was 22. And my first year I made a half a million bucks. Changed everything. I wasn't broke anymore. And I was just looking at what is it like to make a million or two. So the moment you made that first 500 that year, you're aggressively wanting, you want to get to the million now. Of course. Absolutely. The key is you had to get out on your own though. So that means you had to open up at least 20 accounts for the, for, I had to open 20 accounts for Bobby. So I'd open an account and then hand that over to Bob. Now Bob would go and pitch and, and pitch, you know, house stocks to that account and he would make all the money and he'd throw me a hundred here, a hundred there, but Bob's making, you know, when, but when I met Bob that night in, in the, in the, in the bar, he told me he made 40 grand that month. I was getting turned down for jobs for 12 grand. You had five bucks in your pocket. 40 grand a month. Now I had, you know, I think he's probably exaggerating. No, he wasn't. Nope. So for my first month, I made $26,000 as a stockbroker. $26,000. And I, you talking about 89? You said? Nine, this was 90. 90. But That's real money. It was real money. It, it, it was, it was so much money to me that I, I was head down and the blinders on so much. When I got that check, Beethoven, I went to my sales assistant and I said, Ellen, this guy's made a mistake. 
He gave me 26 grand. You won't believe it. They messed up. Believe them. that? What, what should I do? Should I go tell Jordan? Should I, what should I do? She looked at me. She's like, John, you did $160,000 in gross commission. You paid the firm back all the money they owed you that you owed them because you, you, right. you collect that. And minus taxes, minus this, that's what you're owed. That's your check. I'm like, so I can go to the bank. I can literally leave right now. And cash this <laughs> and get $26,500 in cash. She's like, yeah, you can do that if you want. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Porsche dealership. <laughs> You've been waiting for this day. That Fuck same me. month. Porsche dealership. But to get on my own was was challenging because Bobby was getting all these accounts. He had like a super- How much Bobby was making around that time, you believe? Uh probably close to a million a year. Probably something in the, oh. you know, seven to one, 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 two, depending on the year. He's, I was a big producer. Well. He was good on the phone, real good. And you know, just just had a good rap, mm-hmm. right? But he didn't want to lose me. So I'm opening all these accounts. And Danny Porsche, who ran the boardroom at that time. What's Danny's last name? Porsche. Oh, poor. I thought it was Danny Porsche. Like, it's like, yeah, kind of worked Danny out. He was, he, he was a phenomenal salesman. Um, and he was, uh, he was the, basically the biggest producer and he was running the boardroom. And he, uh, he, he sees all these accounts come up on the board. He's like, Clancy, pitch the room. You pitch the room. You get a microphone in front of you, similar to this. And your phone is here. And you, and you and you pitch is here, and what you do is you pretend you're pitching a cus, a customer, and they role play. So Danny becomes the customer, and he's got his microphone in the front of the room, and I'm one of the hundreds of desks that's in the room, and I'm sitting there, and I pitch the room, and mm. he's you know I'm done, I'm finally finally done, and this guy he's like this guy is a killer, he's on his own. And so I'm this like, is literally Wolf of the same thing we saw in that movie. The same action that's happening in there. Yeah, but this is yeah. The, the, the movie wasn't really realistic from <laughs> in, in in the in the boardroom. The boardroom was much more uh, um, business like. Um, it wasn't like it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't and, a party. It was. Nah, it was but the atmosphere, the aggressiveness. That the, was definitely there. And he said, "He's a killer. This guy's on his own." Bobby stands up. No, he's not. He's still opening accounts to me. Danny's like. He's on his own. And then I was, that's. That's the breaking point. That's it. And then the next 30 days, I get a $26,000 check. And then they got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What's the largest check you believe you got? At Stratton, probably on a month, probably 180, 200. 180. What happens when you get that 180? It's just, it's just hard to explain um, making that kind of money at that age. So how you're about 25, 26? Yeah. Something like that. 20, 26, making 180,000. And the average is what you believe. In the boardroom? Um, 15 maybe. But average you're making. Average I'm making. Uh, you know, I, 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 I never made like, uh, you know, three, four million at Stratton. I made, I made, that at Monroe Parker, which was a Stratton offshoot afterwards. But yeah, I mean, between five, uh, 500,000 my first year, I probably was making between one and two and a half million a year, something like that. How do you manage that? How's the mindset you got to have to take on one to two million dollars a year at 26, 27? Yeah, not, I didn't manage it that well at all. <laughs> Mentally, financially. You know, you think uh, you were prepared for that type no of money? No way. I was out of my mind. I was, I was just, I spent everything. I was, uh, you know, just, it was all about girls and, and flashy parties and the Hamptons. And the, I, I bought a 55 foot sea ray, you know, just, to, uh, yeah, I was just, just, I was like, uh, you know, it's just a 20 something year old making a lot of money and just spending it all. When did it go bad? Well, it's funny because the first few years at Stratton were like, it was like win-win. It was like, they used to call it broker Disneyland because it was. It was before um, the sophisticated short players um, 
started attacking Stratton. When Stratton got sued by the uh, SEC, they became a target. So previous to that, I was able to make good money for myself, actually make my clients money, and and Stratton obviously made money. So it was the it was the trifecta, which is really difficult to to keep going because this was a, a major fraud. But the sophisticated investors that were shorting eventually put Stratton out of business. And people think the SEC or the FBI put Stratton out of business. No. Stratton went out of business because they just got attacked because they were in, they were doing business um, fraudulently, and the sophisticated investor knew it and was shorting their stocks. And eventually, you can't just continue to to smoke clients and and have a successful firm. So um, it, it was, uh, but but we did have broker Disneyland for a few years there, and it was and it was incredible. It was. It was incredible. So before I even go to the bat, the first time you were able to see that you're, you're a millionaire now. Yeah. What is that feeling like? Was it everything you thought you were, you wanted? Yeah, it was. <laughs> just, just to be honest. Yeah. Just to be honest, you know, I'm a kid. I'm like, I got a model girlfriend and, um, and I have a million dollars living in the city, um, in a, in a penthouse and I have the Porsche, I have the Range Rover, you know, check, 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 check. I can eat out wherever I want. Um, so after so, you got to the point where you met all the, the goals that you wanted monetarily and all the other fancy things, what, what happens now in life? Well, you know, then, uh, you know, then, you know, God goes to work. Right. And so um, people think that they find God, but they don't. He finds you. And he was slowly, but surely, um, putting me in a box and taking these things away that I thought were um, fulfilling my life. And even to the point where, you know, the toys were great, um, but the power of running a boardroom, the power of giving a, 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 a speech or a presentation to a hundred or hundreds of, of guys and everyone looking at you like, man, this guy, look at this guy, you know. People say, man, you, you, this guy's great. Everyone would record me. My tapes were all over the street. Um, and everyone said, oh, man, Clancy's the best. And I'd be like, I guess I am. I'm the best. Yeah, of course I'm the best. The problem with that was there was kind of like a ho hole like here. This is the way I look back on it. And no matter what I put in here, the Porsche, the model, um, the toys, uh, the boat, penthouse, the trips, private jets, no matter what I put in here, it wasn't enough. The drugs, and the drugs got worse and worse. Um, it just, you're just not fulfilled. And you, you're just going, for, you, what's the next, you know, hot thing I can try to fill this void in my spirit with, right? But you don't, you know, you don't recognize it, but, that's essentially what's going on. And, um, and meanwhile, what God is doing is stripping me of my um, pride. Because people tell me I'm the best. And, I, you know, if anybody told me that today, they wouldn't, I would not take that. I would not tell, I would not take that compliment. But it did so well for you. I know it did. It, in, in, in worldly uh, view, yes, but the reality was, um, as things got uh, rough at Stratton and my clients weren't making as much money as they were, and then eventually losing a lot of money after we got sued by the SEC, my clients got their investments were cut in half in a day, and it it, it got bloodier and bloodier as as time went on, and it was it was really really difficult at the end to make my clients money. And that was a, an incredible strain on me personally. Um, Cause I, I believed in what I pitched. It's interesting. You, you won't hear this anywhere else. At Stratton, there was two different kinds of stocks. There was chop stocks, crappy companies. And then there was earnings based companies. 
And if you bought the earnings-based company, especially in the first several years, there was a really good chance you make your clients money. But there was always a crap stock that paid usually two to three times on commission that you could put your client into. I chose to put my client in good stocks because I, I needed to, I was one of those salesmen that needed to believe what I was pitching. So I would maintain these relatively large positions, you know, large in the whole scheme of wall street with a pike or a small guy, but in, in that, in that uh, boardroom or in that universe I was in relatively large positions in these, in these stocks and the stocks generally would, would do, would do well. You know, Steve Madden's a good example. Steve Madden shoes, a ton of that stock. And, and it, it did well for me very well, not, you know, for my clients, me personally as with bonuses. Um, but it was, you know, it, it, as, as the fraud got more and more exposed, it got worse and worse and worse. And as it got worse and worse and worse, I got worse and worse and worse. So it was more drugs and more uh, debauchery, debaucherous type of behavior, more drinking. And, you know, the minute I got out of the boardroom toward the end, it was like immediately joint in the mouth. And then by the time I'm at dinner, it's, you know, 10 or 20 milligrams of Valium or Quaalude and, you know, hard liquor. Every day or not often? Every, not every day, um, but often, like certainly every Thursday, Friday and Saturday night. Um, but every day, every day with the weed. Not not hard liquor going out because you couldn't do that. I had to be up in the morning and back at the office. But uh, but some people did. Some people did every day and the, with the coke. The coke was. I lost. I, I lost a lot of friends to it. Like dead in you know in the ground. Yeah, the coke was bad. I mean, I stopped it early because I just didn't. Me and coke didn't get along. But if if you you kept up with that at Stratton, there was a funeral. Wow. So that was part of the losing 50 people. You knew somebody was going to die basically with, well, with that a was drug a, overdose. That, that, that meat grinder was more like kids coming in and out of the system. But there was a, you know, there was a lot of people that, that didn't make it out of Stratton. Or, or, you think or, it's just the, the power of earning so much money and not being prepared for it? Yes. And, and, and not having any, you know, not having any, um, spiritual so that yeah. void was that void the 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 missing link you believe was you know jesus well, God? I, I know it i know it now of course yeah but back then you had no clue no clue so what could someone do you know that you know now to be prepared to make that type of money it's <sighs> a great question um i think it's the responsibility of people that have been through it to to tell the story and to tell the truth. Hustle testimony. That's why we're doing this show. Yeah. To tell the truth that that running after that was not the answer. And was it not the answer to go chase it or because it's chasing it, the bad part or mismanaging it. I think chasing it with the wrong motivation is the bad part because if you're, ch if I, if I'm chasing a business goal today, I'm chasing it to make money for my family and to help others. Right. So I'm up to, I'm not going to lie. I live a nice lifestyle, but uh, helping others is a huge, huge piece of why I build businesses. Now I didn't have that back then. I, did I help others? Sure. I gave a bunch of money away in quote unquote loans <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that never got paid back. But yeah, sure. I, you know, it, I think it's the motivation that's behind the goal that you set. And if that motive is off because you have no um, relationship uh, in my, my humble opinion to God, right. And, and if you don't have that anchor, then it's all about you. And if it's all about you, that's a problem. That's, that was my problem. I'll speak from my, my standpoint at the end, when things started really getting bad and the firm went out of business and I realized that I was being investigated and followed and, 
it, it, wow. Yeah, it got, it got hairy. And then one day I woke up and on the front page of the Wall Street Journal was John Clancy, trainer for the Wolf of Wall Street, pitches Warren Buffett or whatever it was, whatever it is. Front page. Not, not page one, not page two, not page three. So did you know this four. was coming out? You had no clue. I did. I knew it. I spent about a half a million dollars to try to not have it, it not come out or clean it up. Didn't work came out anyway. And it was, let's just say less than flattering. So wall street journal got a hold of all my tapes. My tapes were ubiquitous in the small cap uh, world because um, I was, I, I let people tape me and, you know, not to sound like a you know, cocky or anything, but I, you know, God gave me some real gifts. I was good on the phone. So people wanted to hear, Clancy tape, though there's, oh, great. They plug on Clancy tape. The way I learned is I listened to great producers and I would put my headphones on and literally and all in. night I would listen to this, even, even while I was asleep, to subconsciously let it, let it sink in. And people were doing that with my tapes. So when the firm went out of business, we were, you know, I was kind of like a bit of a sitting target. Uh, Jordan and Danny were already arrested. Um, they were doing their plea. They were doing that. You know, Jordan was already working with them and testifying against a, a number of people. Uh, um, it's, you know, uh, I know all those details now reading Jordan's two books. Um, but at that point, um, I wasn't sure if I was a target, but the day the wall street journal article came out just by the sheer amount of money that I made, and knowing what the the scope of the fraud and knowing that Danny and Jordan had been indicted and my other two bosses were also indicted, I had a feeling I was, a, I was a target. So I called my dad who called my uncle and we formulated a plan to, uh, to figure out if I was a target. And we reached out to the federal, uh, the, the uh, AUSA that was over the case, um, in, in Manhattan, uh, these guys are, you know, no joke. They indict you. You're when they're coming to get you. They're coming. Yeah, yeah. And you got no shot, right? So, I needed to know, and they confirmed. Yes, he's a target. Um, so I, I knew I didn't. I knew I didn't do. I didn't break any of these these federal, uh, you know, securities laws. So I needed to explain myself. So I went in and did what's known as a proffer, which is an queen for a day, they call it. It's a proffer. You go in, you tell them everything, everything. And then, um, and they, and if they decide to indict you, they can't use that against testimony you. against you. So I went in a couple of days down, downtown Manhattan to the USA and, and, you know, to their credit, I told them everything. My, my uncle told me going in, he goes, you tell them everything. Your uncle was a police officer. Also? Yeah. And, um, he was, he was the head of security for, um, he, I was for many, many years. And at the time for, uh, Madison square garden. So he was, he knew a lot of the, you know, the people in the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the right players, law enforcement. And he said, listen, John, he, he, these guys are no joke. They already know everything. everything. All you can do is tell them the truth. If you leave anything out and you try to protect yourself in any way, you're screwed. They're going to indict you. And then you're going to just spend some time in jail. You know, it was that simple. So I went in, I told him everything. I told him about the drugs, told him about the hookers, told him about everything. What they wanted to know about you know, was the cash, the, the, the stuff you see in the Wolf of Wall Street. You know, all this craziness, this nonsense that, you know, uh, giving IPO stock to your friends and flipping the money back and not paying taxes and sending money overseas and all this crazy stuff. And I was like, Guys, I'm a W-2 employee. <laughs> yeah, not, the only not, cash I know about is the stuff I took out of the ATM. You know, I, I didn't have access to the trading account. And, you know, I, didn't do any, I didn't do any of this stuff. Now, did I misrepresent over the telephone? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I misrepresented. Yeah, Because I, I made things sound great, just like stockbrokers do. Mm -hmm. And if there was something negative in a prospectus, I didn't mention it. And by the letter of a misrepresentation, by the letter of that law, I needed to tell my client everything, even the negative stuff. So, so the misrepresentation, you know, look, I was, 
was guilty of that, but that, but they weren't looking at that. You know, that's like an SEC violation. They wanted the other stuff. They wanted tax evasion, manipulation. They wanted the, the, you know, they wanted mm -hmm. the real crimes. And, you know, I got to say, um, and again, you know, it's, it's easy to, everyone's you know, we're saying the FBI did this and this guy's a bad prosecutor. These guys, they didn't, they didn't think twice about it. They were like, look, this guy didn't do what we are looking to prosecute. And they passed on me. Wow. Good and bad. So they said, you're good. We're not going to indict you. The negative of that is now this big target is on my back from New York state. Feds pass on me, but New York state took a, big shot at me. So there was a, a guy by the name of Dennis Vacco that was the attorney general at the time. And he was looking to climb up that political ladder and looked at me and my top producers, my friends as easy targets. And when I went from the, the proverbial frying pan into the fire, because you get indicted by the feds, you cut a deal, you go to a federal minimum security prison, you know, not terrible. Right. right. In a few years, do a deal. You know, not terrible. Right. But now I'm staring at real jail, real jail. They hit me with 13 felony counts, Ooh. accusing me of everything that the federal government knew I didn't do. The question is, did they already know that I didn't do it? Or they just, I looked like an easy target and we made millions of dollars in the middle of this fraud you know, did they, did they know up front that I didn't do any of this? I, I still don't know to this day, but I do know that, um, through the discovery process, they eventually found out that I didn't do it. So you'd think they dropped the charges. Mm. No. Cause now he's chasing something else. Everyone's chasing their thing. So we ended up, me and my friends, going to trial and, and fighting uh, against the state of New York. And I mean, there's so many details. I don't know how detailed you want me to get on this, but this, I'm good. Go. There's so many details here. So I'm a big target. I'm the top producer. Um, so the first thing they do is they indict me and they uh, try to get me to flip on my friends. So, um, I say um, to my attorney, um, attorney calls me and says, yeah, you know, you're facing 20 years. There's a 97% conviction rate in New York state for this kind of crime. And you're facing 20. So your worst case scenario is you're in jail, real jail, John, for 20 years. Your best case scenario is probably, you know, your best case scenario is obviously acquittal. But if you don't get acquitted, you're probably still going to do between five and 10 years. Real jail. So um, I said, so, okay, so what does it look like if I testify against my friends? No jail, you take a felony, that's it. It's like, so w w how do I testify against my friends if I didn't, wasn't controlling the trading account, I didn't take any cash, I didn't do any of this, the, all these, you know, these things the feds were looking at. And she's like, well, you need to say that you did have access to the trading account. You need to say that you did do this. You need to say you did do that. I said, Wait a minute. So they want you to tell these things that you did not do? Yes. I had a list of things I had to say that I did. Yeah. That's reality. That's the, that's the real world. It's the real world. They want a conviction. In that process, how was your father, your parents in that time? They, my, my, my mom had already passed away, but my father was there for me the whole way. You know, he was at mo pretty much every day of my trial. My uncle was great. He was there, helped me out. Uh, you know, we had private investigators working and interviewing all the, all the witnesses. Um, it's funny, it, you know, it's a three month trial facing basically my life, right? Right. It's 20 years in, in real jail. How old were you around that time? Uh, 34, uh, 32 to 34 ish. Um, you know, I'm facing. This, and, and I, I, you look back on it, I'm like, I know that this was God just orchestrating everything. Because here's how it, st 
the beginning of the end happens. I meet my, uh, this sweet little Christian girl, Regina, in the office. Probably two and a half years before the before we close the doors, and she's this just absolutely beautiful, sweet, loving, awesome girl. And I'm dating, you know, literally an elite model. And when I say elite model, I mean she worked for the elite modeling agency and made a living <laughs> at, right. like getting you her a real picture taken. Model. Yeah, right. So, so and, and you know, she comes into the office sometimes, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, oh, look at that. oh, that's Glancy's girl." Yeah, okay, you know, that, that's just how I rolled back then. But then I see this amazingly sweet girl. Not 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 that Colleen, my girlfriend, wasn't sweet. She was. She was. She was great. Right. She was a great girl. Loved me. Wanted to marry me. But God just got a hold of my heart and was doing something. And I just couldn't figure out why I couldn't get this girl out of my head. And eventually I made the crazy decision to break up with my girlfriend and go out with this sweet little Regina. Wow. I mean, she was beautiful and everything, especially with those mini skirts, man. Everything worked out. <laughs> yeah. I get it. But God was like working on me big time. So I meet her father and he's a construction worker who's living in a tenement in Yonkers. And I mean, a like, pretty mm. bad area. I pulled up the first time to meet her parents. And trust me, I put that top up on that Porsche and I was Real like, did you <laughs> lock in that? But you know, I, I, I was, Looking, uh, looking out the window, you know, I was like, where's, right, my, right, where's right. my Porsche? Where's my Porsche? The first time I meet this guy, the first thing out of his mouth, he says, John, do you know Jesus Christ? Now, Regina had warned me that this was going to happen. But he had this incredible continent, countenance on and, and this peace about him that I could not put my finger on. Now, construction worker, broke, right? In my mm -hmm. eyes, right? What, like, I, I just don't, he's living in a tenement. How is he so happy and peaceful? Does it make sense to uh, raise John? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all, you know, messed up. You know, this is, this is toward the end, right? So I'm like, man, what is going on? How does this guy have this peace about him? Sticking in the back of my head, right? So as time's going on now, I'm going to church sometimes, Regina, Regina. You come to church with me, please. Come to church, go into this Pentecostal church. I look at this pastor, look at his suit. Like, what's going on? Is this money am grab? I doing it's here? A money grab, you know, and then, and then, but then, you know, then I'm like, wait, wait, these guys are really nice. I mean, I meet all these people and I'm like, you know what? There's something about this, but I'm still my crazy John, right? I'm going, I'm going out Regina, but I'm still a rock star. I'm a rock, I'm still a rock star. I'm still, you know, doing my thing behind Regina's back, still living in the city. Just, you know, she's just my girl now, and I'm just going to cheat on her whenever I want. You know? But I have a question for you and go through to the Regina piece. Do you believe your elite model, you got rid of her because of you going down? No. I believe I got rid of her because I, I broke up with her because I was falling for Regina. 100%. And that's the way God wanted it. Mm. He needed, he, he was planning his destruction of John Clancy, the man. And, and that was the beginning of it, meeting Regina. And then um, what happened pretty quickly was as things got worse and worse at the office, um, it became apparent to me that there was something going on fraudulent wise. Um, it was really, really difficult to make our clients money. And there were certain patterns. I was asked to sell stock sometimes, even though the stock, I knew the stock was going up and they would still tell me, you know, so we need, we need that stock. We need that stock. And I was like, no, I'm not selling it. And, you know, one time they took me out, gave me a quail in the middle of the day and I, I made the trade and the stock went, I sold the stock. My client wow. got screwed and I realized that, you know, like, I'm like, I'm in bed with the devil. You know, I just, I realized it. It, it, it was all about, you know, them um, making, making money making money, and even at the expense of, of my client. So I stayed around way too long 
Uh, but getting back to um, my my case, um, so you got what you know. We got a three month trial. I'm preparing for trial. I tell these guys I'm not taking the deal. I'm not testifying against my friends. Um, and then I have this great idea of going to the Bahamas, even though I'm, uh, I'm out on a half a million dollars in bond. But back then, before 9-11, you can go to the Bahamas with a driver's license. They took my passport when I got indicted, right? Well, they take it, hold it for bond. But the Bahamas was our playland. You know, we just go and take, take a jet and- Go there and you know, come right go, back. Yeah, just like, you know. But at this point, I was, I was with my friend Lewis, who, another one I buried, uh, one of my best friends. And um, he, he, he was nuts. He was certifiably crazy. <laughs> like, right. you know, I introduced him to all this stuff, the hookers and everything. And he was just crazy. Wrong guy to introduce this lifestyle <sighs> to. Crazy. And we went and took it down in the Atlantis for, for two or three days and then uh, flew back. And even him, as crazy as he was, he looked at me on the way back in the plane. He says, man, what's wrong with you, man? I'm like, what? what you? He's like, freaking crazy. I, had sex with like two girls, like maybe three in two days. And I'm like 32 at the time. And these girls were like, you know, in their twenties, you know, young twenties. And I'm just off the deep end. I've got a six pack. I'm tan. I'm just crazy, but I'm, I'm out there. I'm facing 20 years. So, so you live in life. There's, there's, there's a, a switch that clicked and I became crazier, like mm. off the deep end. Crazy. With Regina at that? Yeah. 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 At this point, Regina is pregnant with my son, my first son, and I'm in the Bahamas, you know, banging uh, yeah. girls. So it's just, it just, he yeah, really went crazy. I went crazy. And this, this, but this was Christ's plan. This was his plan. He's planned the whole thing. I go back to sign into my, my, uh, bail bondsman. And this was the biggest bail she's ever written. And I knew she's very nervous about me running, but I went to the Bahamas anyway, because how is she going to find out? Right? Just an ID. I'm gone. Yeah, exactly. So I go to sign in. Come back. I'm back. I'm a good guy. I'm signing in, you know, a couple of days later and boom, cameras on, handcuffs, throw me in the back of a van. Where were you? In front of the judge, all tan and everything. And the judge just looked at me and goes, Mr. Clancy, do you have any idea how much trouble you're in? I'm like, yeah, I do. I, I, I do. He's like, you took off and went to the Bahamas because you have a driver's license and you didn't need your passport. And you thought that I would be okay with that. And I didn't even know what to say. And he looked at me, he's like, boom, million dollars. So now all this money, the wall street journal money, all this, and I'm starting to like be illiquid for the first time in a long time. Now I got to get my sisters to put their house up. I got to come up with more cash and I'm starting to, you know, I already had to pay my attorney a bunch of money. So I'm still, he's slowly stripping me. You big shot Clancy. Yeah. I'm going to take it away from you and see how you see how you feel. They threw me in real jail. The place you're running from that you were not trying to go visit real jail. Now, Vacco, he wants me to testify against my friends. So what's the best way to, to get me to do that? Don't put me in a holding cell like they would typically with a guy like me, no priors or anything white collar. No, they put me in penitentiary with drug dealers, gang members, and murderers. Yes. Real jail. Real jail. And Clancy got a little bit of a wake-up call. Jesus style. And I saw some things for the first seven days that shook my world. And I had protection in there because I had a guy come up to me and say, hey, listen, put money in my commissary and I'll, you know, I'll be your protector. And I did that. So I didn't get shanked or killed or anything, but I saw some crazy stuff that Beethoven, it. Too extreme. You're from, you're, you just come from the Bahamas. Now you're in real jail. Real jail. And I, like I said, I saw some, you know, some violence and some, just some really crazy stuff. So on the seventh day, uh, oh, but by the way, I'm in jail. I was in there for seven days to, to, to another half a million. We came up with the bail the next day, but I couldn't get out. They wouldn't let me out. They knew what they were doing. They, they're wearing me down. 
and I, it, it, it really worked. I was a complete mess, a puddle, but Jesus was working here. Right. So Cause you also have a, a, a girlfriend that's pregnant. Yeah. And at this point she's ready to, to, to have nothing to do with me. Cause she knows I was, knows now that I'm in the Bahamas and she knows what happens when I go to the Bahamas. So she knows, knows that I'm with other girls and meanwhile, she's got my son in her belly and just to, just, yeah, you were a mess, John. I was going to let yeah. you know. If no, you I was know. Talking, yeah, certifiable. Uh, and, and from a sexual standpoint, I was, I was sick. It was all about getting another girl and having sex with her and then moving on to the next one. It was, it was a sickness. And I don't know where that came from, but I, I had it. And it was. You're a rock star. It was bad. It goes with the lifestyle. Yeah, it was, it was real bad though. Um, so. <clears throat> I, after the seventh day, I go in front of the judge and, um, and he's like, uh, well, the bail's not ready yet. And they put me in a, in a cell, you know, I, look, this ha had to have been orchestrated by, by these prosecutors. It just had to have been, it was just too crazy. They put me in a cell. Uh, they woke me up first about four, 4 a.m. Put me in one cell to another cell to another cell. This is called bullpen therapy. This is something that justice system that exists, but you, but you're chained, you're chained to your hands, to other inmates. So I'm chained to like a drug dealer or a gang member. And these guys are all on their way to trial in the most stressful times of their life. So they're fighting and bickering with each other and, and, I, and I'm chained to them. And I like, I'm at the end of my rope at this point, I'm seven days in real jail. <laughs> I'm at the, and I, 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 my back is so <laughs> I stressed, laugh, but I could only imagine your mind. Oh, my back is so like tight that I can't feel it anymore. My legs are shaking, but you can't show that you're nervous to these guys. Cause they'll just kick your ass. Right. So I got to somehow hold up, you know, John Clancy from friggin' Massapequa. Yeah, sure. For, for these guys, these guys are hardened criminals. Right, I'm gonna get my ass kicked if I show any weakness, and I don't have Derek, who's my protector anymore, because now I'm mm. in transit. So I'm trying to keep up, trying to keep up, trying to keep up, and finally, after about literally ten jail cells, they take me out and they throw me in my own, but it's in the back of the courtroom, and I'm going to see the judge, which should be when ten, fifteen, twenty minutes, and you know, go see the judge. They put a stamp on it. I had everything, the money set up, and everything. Should be boom, boom, he's out. Seven hours later, in a jail cell, by myself, facing 20 years, I know Vaco is behind the whole thing now. I know him and his prosecutors are trying to break me. And I just lost it. I lost it. Hysterical crying. And all I could think about was this guy, Bill, Regina's father. And, this, and, the, and the peace he had as a construction worker with no money. And where am I now? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, every time I go to that church, they all have that same peace. It's like, I'm a mess, man. I can't get any worse. Maybe this Jesus thing is real. That thought comes into my mind in the six and a half hour. And as I'm crying, I just say to myself, you know what? What do I have to lose? My life's over. Jesus, that Bill knows, if you're real, come into my life right now. Give me that same peace and I'll follow you for the rest of my life. I will be a foot soldier. I promise you. I'm a loyal guy. You know that. I will follow you for the rest of my life. Six and a half hours in that jail so you start negotiating with Jesus. That's right. And about a few minutes after that prayer, door opens up. I knew it. I said, I knew it. I knew that I knew that I knew. And that, that hole that I had, that I was trying to fill with the fame and the girls and the jets and the hookers and the drugs and the, everything else was immediately filled. Immediately. I was convicted of things I would do all the time, like curse and lie uh, and cheat uh, and all these things that I, I was immediately convicted. It was just an, an, like an instantaneous conviction. It was incredible. And I knew when he opened the door and went out and they stamped my, 
And they, they sent me back for two more days, by the way. <laughs> Even after they stamped it, they said, oh, you got to go back two more days. I'm like, really? I've, I've been here for seven days doing a real, in real jail. In real jail. This is not the TV. <laughs> this is no joke, right? Two more days. I go back. Hey, Derek, how you doing? I, uh, I called my sister that night and I remember like hiding, you know, cause you gotta, you, you, know, you gotta hide. I'm hysterical crying on the payphone. Kathy, something happened to me. What happened? What happened? I'm like, something happened in the jail. I, I, I talked to Jesus and I accepted him and, and something happened. Something real happened in my life. Now I'm facing, I'm still facing the same 20 years. Right. But I have this incredible peace about it. Mm. That peace that passes all human understanding, according to, to his word, it was, it was just there. Same circumstance, same thing. Peace beyond all recognition. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I was like, it can't be this easy. This is too good to be true. But I ran with it and I just said, God, you know what? I'm in the ensuing weeks. I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done cheating on Regina. I said, Bill said, I, I went to Bill. I said, Bill, I don't want to cheat on your daughter anymore. You know, I've been bad, right? He said, I know John. Jesus knows too. I said, well, he goes, what do I do? He goes, ask for deliverance of it. He goes, I knew I was convicted of all these things, but I knew I was going to still be banging with girls. I knew it. He said, ask for, ask for deliverance. I said, what, what, what's that? Just ask Jesus to deliver you from that. There's, there's, every once in a while, there's a, there's a sin that's so strong. The enemy has so strong. You need a supernatural deliverance. I was like, that sounds great. Driving How down do you the do road. do that? I'm driving down the road. Yeah, next time. I said, supernatural deliverance of that. And, and, and all, <laughs> the, all the lust I feel for all these other girls, make it love for Regina. Like a Power Ranger. Yes. And he's like, boom. Here you go. Have that. I never looked at another girl with that kind of intent and that lust. I forget. No, of course I see beautiful girls in the gym with these freaking these yoga <laughs> pants. I mean, it's a, they're, and, they're and, evil. I, and I respect it like beautiful, mm -hmm. but I don't think about it like that anymore. It's gone. He took it away. He took it away. Like I used to look at that and be like, Oh, I'm going to wait here and just going to go get You're a smoothie and I'm going to go, I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. And now it just wouldn't even enter my mind because that all that lust I have, I had is now love for my wife. She'll tell that's you. Change, that's she, a game changer. She, oh, it's a game changer. She'll tell you. I'm just completely head over heels in love with her for 22 years. But that, that experience is why I'm here. Why when somebody says you got to give your testimony, I will drop everything because I made a deal with Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the first and the last. Alpha Omega. I made a deal with him. And that's not a deal you want to renege on. Mm. And that deal is I'm your foot soldier. I will be there if you tell me to be there. And that um, obedience unlocks a lot of doors for me in my daily life now and my business. And, you know, I have that, you know, when I have that obedience, I'm not saying I always have it. Definitely screw up. Plenty, probably more than I think. right, right, right. But uh, when I do have that, it's 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 quite quite special. It's uh, that I, I I look at it as like that magic key or that spiritual key that just unlocks things. So, um, finally, I get out after nine days and um, see my wife, and she's all pregnant. And my wife now, my girlfriend then, and uh, I, I told her everything. I apologized. I told her how I cheated on her and. And um, told her I'm going to marry her. I never wanted to marry. Never wanted to get married before that jail cell. Never. Real John turned you into a whole oh, new my person. Goodness, it, it was just just a uh, complete reversal. So then we just uh, were preparing for trial. You know, obviously I have my son on the way, and if I'm going to jail for 20 years, I'm. I'm going to jail for 20 years. I'm not going to know my son, but right. And my, she's going to be with some, I always say, you're going to be with some, some rich, freaking ugly old fat guy. So right. why does he have to be old and fat? I'm like, right. shut up. Right. So, um, uh, but, I, but I told Jesus, I said, you know, no matter what, I'm going to follow you. 
even if it's prison ministry, I'm going to follow you no matter what. You already had your mindset. I had my mind. And I, I meant that. I did. I meant that. But I said, please don't make it prison ministry. Please. Right, right, right. please. I mean it, but God, if you're going to adjust yeah, the yeah, agreement. Right, right. But I do mean it. I did mean it. And again, that's that, that's that key that unlocks that, that, that supernatural obedience. Yeah. I'm going to follow you no matter what, even if it's this horrible road, I will be your foot soldier in this road. I, uh, got another call from Mr. Vacco in New York state and said, has Mr. Clancy changed his mind about, um, about testifying, um, and being our, uh, lead testified of lead witness against the other three. He has to say this about the compliance office, who's 73 at the time. This about the trader who, I don't know what I'm going to say about the trader. And my two, two of my best friends. I'm like, um, no, Mr. Clancy's not lying. Tell him to take the deal and stick it. And we went to trial three months and a bevy of witnesses. So many witnesses. And, and what we walked out of that courtroom, 100% acquitted with a 3% chance of getting acquitted, 100%, not a day, nothing, as if it never happened. Acquittal. That All Power Ranger that you had, Jesus Power Ranger <laughs> that you pulled out, day number nine, changed everything. He's, he's no joke. That. That Jesus, Jesus is all the power, Alpha Omega, man. What's that it's, feeling like? The moment it's over. Oh man, it was. You know, you just cry. You know, one of the it's one of the things that you know. As I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing my screenplay now, and I'm writing things, and it's it's one of the things that that you never see in the movies uh, or TV shows is. When you stand up and those 12 people look at you, Jesus had his hand all over this thing. There were people in the, in the jury that were Christians that knew, you know, they knew I was innocent. They knew it. But anyway, th- when you stare at those 12 people and they're about to basically either destroy your life or, you know, give it back to you. Do you know that there's only one bailiff in the room courtroom during the whole trial. But as soon as they're about to make in a criminal court, as soon as they're about to make an actual verdict, they surround you with, with more bailiffs. That feeling. That's a bad feeling. Mm. Cause there's one guy in the corner the whole time. And then all of a sudden they surround you. And I said, so you them, automatically think you're out of there. I said to my daughter, what's going on? She's like, well, you know, if you're guilty, they don't want you to run for it. And just, you know, that feeling in your heart that there's nothing you're going to do. Like I wasn't going to run, but you just, I mean, that's just, that, that's where, that's where you are. And I know where I'm going too. Cause I had spent nine days there. You remember those nine I days. I know where I'm going if I'm, if I'm not acquitted, right. Even if it's a compromised verdict and they get me on a couple of counts, I know where I'm going and that ain't a good place. And then it's one after the other. Read every count for every one of us. Every count. Not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And you just see the, the prosecution that, you know, wanted me to lie and bury my friends. And just You just see their face just like, no, no. Ooh. Yes. Yeah, so, that, no. that feeling of victory. Was your child born then? Or you just... My, my child was on the first day of my trial. I, I wasn't able to see it because the judge wouldn't let me. Jack, he's 22 in college playing baseball right now. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the moment not guilty, you're done with. Walk out, praise God, get married. <laughs> the hour after. <laughs> See, we, we, I was acquitted January 1st was the first day of the trial. January 2nd, um, January 1st, turn of the millennium, 2000, uh, January, February, March, 30 days later, I was married. Your life completely changed 2000. Completely. 
So let's get into it. You're free now. Newly married. New John. Money's different. Totally different. It's not worshipped anymore. But you still have the same mindset to create something. Correct. What do you do then? I get into... Um, hard money lending, which all, all I knew was sales. Um, so I, I got into mortgage broking and, uh, and hard money lending, which is like, uh, you know, basically you, you lend money to investor, uh, investors, developers that can't get bank financing for whatever reason. And, and I'm and doing regular mortgages too. Like, you know, so I'm, I'm literally like driving to people's houses. So you have no record on anything because everything oh, no. was a quit. Oh yeah. One well, like so as, if never, as, as if it never happened. So I'm going right, writing mortgages and, you know, just trying to provide for my family. And, um, you know, then, you know, I just, I, I felt like the sales thing for me just, just didn't feel right anymore. You know, not that I was doing anything wrong, but I just didn't feel like I wanted to sell anymore. So I prayed to God, I said, God, just get me out of this sales thing. I, I don't, I don't want to do the mortgages. I don't want to do this hard money lending thing. I had to uh, raise a bunch of money from investors and, you know, I was making good money and we were and making loans and it was probably oh uh oh five oh six ish you know starting to make my way back and living in uh westchester county at this point i have jack and now my second child um uh which was rachel my my little girl and um and i just i just i, I don't i don't want it anymore god just take take this away one of my friends that got jammed up similar to me, jammed up, meaning uh, facing big, big charges. Um, but it was a cop, totally innocent, right? I went to college with him. And um, he was convicted. He went to jail uh, for four years in North Carolina mm. federal. So he went to he went to trial against the federal government because he was innocent. It doesn't matter because the feds, they beat you anyway. Um, and the Lord puts it on my heart to go and visit him, bring him a Bible and give him the gospel and just be his, be a good friend to him. Right. At that point you're locked in with Jesus. Locked in. Locked in. So what do I do? I pick my family up two or three times a year and drive to North Carolina and, you know, little kids and everything and <laughs> stay at wow. a hotel and go visit my friend and bring him a Bible and talk, talk to him about Christ and just not, and not, not just Christ, just talk to him, just be a friend. Being to him. Friend. Yeah. Cause you know, when you go to jail, like, you know, your friends thin out. You know, and I, I didn't want to be that friend. So toward the end of his sentence, toward the end of his sentence, yeah, I guess that runs, toward the end of his term, whatever they call it, um, they, um, they, uh, he, he comes to me, he says, listen, you know, I lost my pension. And uh, this, this is a bad story too, by the way. Cop decorated. I, the, I was going to. The, fed, the feds come in and, and, and arrest him uh, un, unlawfully, like, like, for, for, like, literally got framed his partner testifies against him and then marries his wife. I mean, you can't make that up. You can't so make that up. He's beaten up real bad beaten in that up. prison. Yep. So, and now is he's, he's in Christ. His, his life is incredible now too. But so he, he tells me, he's like, you know, you know, I, I want to do this thing called plan of fitness. Okay. He's like, you know, I, I, Obviously, I can't get the financing, but I have some cash. You put cash on, I'll put cash in. And we'll that was it. 08, 07, 08 comes along, and the credit crisis blows up my mortgage business. So my prayer was answered. I don't have to be in sales anymore. But I'm broke now again, broke. Now with a family broke. But I got this little plan of fitness thing over here, cash flowing. And then I built another one and another one. So you started Planet Fitness with a friend that got locked up in prison, lost his wife. He gets up. You can't make this up, John. Now he's got an amazing new family and incredible wife, Danielle, and two little beautiful girls. And you go down there to give to bring him a Bible and to be a supportive friend. You guys take that idea and turn it to what it is now because you committed to God, to Jesus Christ. 100%. Remember I told you about that obedience that unlocks the door, that obedience to, to go and be a friend to him is why God blessed me. He must have, cause I thought, yeah, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the thing, right? God, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm being me, a God. foot soldier. Meanwhile, he's like, 
You're a moron. You're about to go out of business. I'm just, I'm just helping you, kid. <laughs> wow. You know, they say God laughs in heaven. He's supposed to be like, oh, here he goes again. Here's think, John think, again. Yeah, he's on top. Yeah, sure he is. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I got, now I'm confused. Like, you, you got to be a believer. Like, at this point, because I, I 100% understand the power of being obedient. It has helped me out. It is the secret to my success of any little success that I have or any big success. Being obedient has always taken over everything I ever done. How does obedience keep on growing in that process? Uh, I, I think it, I just, I know it, I know it's the right thing to do. And because it's the right thing to do in, in God's sight, I just, I, I like to think of it as, you know, do the next right thing. When I, when I'm in that zone is do the next right thing. So what is it, what does it look like to be obedient on a daily basis running multi-million dollar businesses? What does that look like? Let me give you one example. Just one example. I'm sleeping in my bed in Connecticut Right before I moved to Florida, probably nine years ago. No, no, it's like 11 years ago. I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Really? Right really? This is Danbury. So I'm in Danbury and I'm sleeping in my bed. And the Lord says, go to Cincinnati, and drive down Glenway Avenue. I'm like, and not, not, not audibly, but, 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 he, but he tells me to do that. Now, this is an 11 hour drive. But I remember the 11 hour drive I took with Mike, with the kids, you know, with, uh, to visit Mike and Jen. I remember how God came through with me there, but it wasn't even like an, a realization of, of that. It was more, this is what God wants me to do. I don't know why. Sean, you didn't just get in the car and drove. I did the next day. I, first I call my broker and I say, Andrew, what's going on on Glenway? He's like, nothing, man. You've been trying to get on that road for the last five years. There's nothing going on in Glenway. I'm like, are you sure? Double check with, there's a REIT, a real estate investment trust. I don't to kill a shopping center. Right? And I knew if I could open up a Planet Fitness, yeah, it would be a great, like number, like top 1% in the country. I knew it. But there's no real estate because it's a, it's a tough, it's a Western Hills, it's called. It's topography. It's difficult. So um, I said, okay. He goes, so nothing's going on. I said, well, I'll see you in the morning. He's like, John, don't come to Cincinnati. It's a waste of a drive. I know what's going on in this market. I'm here all the time. I drove Glenway today. Nothing is going on. I'll see you in the morning, Andrew. He's like, We're okay. I meet him in the morning. I drive down Glenway and right next to the shopping center, which is a target anchor shopping center that we wanted in on was a, Red Lobster that went out of business the day before and a sign went up that day that said for sale or lease. Best real estate in the market by far, but it's only 1.76 acres. It's tough to build a plan of fitness at 1.76 acres. You need like, you know, 150 parking spaces minimum. So, you know, of course, everyone's like, you know, Andrew's like, yeah, no, the, I didn't see that sign. No, I, that, that sign going out. I said, but I called up Darden, who owns Red Lobster, and I said, I said, when did the sign go up? Oh, we just put it up. We don't, I want to buy your. I want to buy it. I'm like, all right. Well, then we start the negotiation of buying it. I go to my development guys, and I said, listen, we got to figure out how to build a plan of fitness here. This is the best site. And they're just like, ah, John, it's just, you know. Why yeah. was it the best site? It's just real real estate one on one. It's a plus site. You know, it's just where we want to be. Um, busy road, just great great real estate. Right. I don't know why Darden closed that as a Red Lobster, but they did. Thank God. Literally, thank God. Um, and my development guys like, yeah, they not, I don't think it's going to fit. It's, I don't know how we make this work. I said, well, what if we went up two stories? So net, there was no two story plan of fitnesses in the system at the, at that time. So I said, let's put a smaller footprint so we can fit more parking and let's go up and do like a mezzanine or a second story. Mm. And I don't know this. My, my partner, Bob's the, he's a smart real estate guy. He's a smart de developer guy. I'm the real estate guy. He's a construction guy. He's like, yeah, let's do a mezzanine. And, and we worked on it. And 
Today, that is a 1%, one top 1% of the system, Planet Fitness. And that was the first start of a portfolio that today is worth $150 million that I built, like that God, God built, but I did it on accident. Like I just did it to find the best sites. The value of the real estate is great. It's the value of the real estate, but God knew he saw through time that if I was obedient and I pulled the trigger on the first one, what, what he could do. So that's just one example. I got like a hundred of those. <laughs> so literally after you guys build a planet fitness, how did the other things come about? The other franchise? Yeah. I'm franchise. Yeah. So, so we just, we have, a, a, you know, left, you know, excess cash flow. I'm a plan of fitness businesses. I mean, it's, it's tens, good business. tens and tens of millions of dollars in cash flow. It's just, it's just an incredible business. And that, and we build them big and bad and we built, we, they're all in great locations. We, you know, we, we really do the right thing. Uh, we operate them. We're just a class operator in every way. Um, and so we have a lot of cash flow and we, we use that cash flow to build other businesses. And now we're doing um, apartment buildings, multifamily. Um, so you guys got it more aggressive with real estate. Yes. And the other franchises, did you guys create those or you guys no, just bought? We're just, we're just franchisees. We just franchisees. So with all this, you know who I'm really thinking of right now is Regina mm. and this whole process. Because the faith that her father instilled in you or the believing, you know, her and her father, mm. how does that affect you in the process of building these businesses? Um, it's <sighs> Bill died like right after our wedding. Wow. He saw what happened now. You saw it. Yeah. And his wife, Helene has lived with us ever since. And uh, she was, she was a big part of this too. Her, her spirit is just incredible. Um, but you know, I, that, you know, that, um, what do they call it? First love, right? That first love that I saw in Bill and Helene and Regina and the rest of that group in a uh, fortress Bible church in Mount Vernon, New York was, you know, just so impactful that it's, it, it'll always stay with me, you know, that I, and I, some of, a lot of times I pray, so give me that first love. Like I felt like when I, when I drove that car down the Spring Book and I said, Spring Brook Parkway, and I said, God, just take away this loss from other and just give it all to Regina. And he was just gracious enough to just do it for me because he knew I couldn't do it on my own. He knew it. And it was probably stemmed from, when I was young and not popular and an awkward, uh, you know, just a terrible athlete and a bad student. And I would, you know, this girl I like really fell for and she went, you know, with a friend of mine and I just felt like inadequate and angry. And I think I kept that with me, you know, to like dominate girls no matter what, you know, and he just, mm. he had to like take that away. So that first kind of that first love, was powerful enough to just smash it all. Just like, just smash it. You know what I'm saying? Like you take a sledgehammer, something that you don't like, like, uh, you know, this is alarm mm -hmm. in my house that keep, kept going off. And, was, <laughs> right. e -e 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 -e, and I just took it outside in the driveway and smashed it. <laughs> <laughs> just, I get just, it. Because it just felt good. Yeah. Right. That, that's the way God smashed that, you know, old man, that kind of old, decrepit spirit that, um, that the noise you were dealing with. Yeah. It was, and it was, it was a, uh, it was a real strong, um, demonic spirit. But when, Jen, what, what I, my question is to you guys is, so how the, the part that Regina played in your life in that time and what part because that had to grow you, grow the relationship. Like, speak about that experience and her partnership with everything that you're doing. Um, so she's like not only my wife; she's my best friend. She's just we just she's just incredible, and she's always been that way. 
she's just always been, even, even in the beginning of the marriage, when I was working too hard, when I was doing the, the sales stuff and I wasn't around a lot, she was just always so just understanding and, you know, the kids were young and she was going out of her mind sometimes, you think with hormones and everything else, but she still was just such a great wife and just a great partner and a great friend. Um, and I mean, obviously Regina is, you say, you're thinking about Regina. When you look at our story, this story, God's story, mm-hmm. Regina is the key to it. Mm. She really is. Right. So he puts her in my life. The perfect time. When I have what I thought was the perfect girl. And he's like, no, this is what I have for you. Which was the perfect girl in God's eyes, which was now I look at it like, oh my goodness, totally the perfect girl. Like for me, like no pressure. That's huge for me because I'm, I create a lot of stuff. She brought the peace that she She brings the peace. Yeah. I create, I'm a creator, which sometimes can cause, you know, Boy, I know the feeling. Yeah. It causes stuff, right? You know, you create stuff, you cause stuff. And, and if you don't have that, Peace. It's that peace influence, you know, first from obviously from God, but God works through people to, mm-hmm. to inject that into your life. And that's what Regina is. She's a, she's a source of peace and, uh, she's just amazing. How many children you have? We have Jack, my oldest. We have Matthew, my youngest and Rachel in the middle. Rachel goes to Wheaton and Matthew goes to PBA. So we're empty nesters officially as of oh, two man. weeks ago. Man. Yeah. And what, your story and your experience that and everything God has done for you, how do you instill that in your children? That's a great question. Uh, First of all, they know the story. Uh, I didn't hide, you know, we don't hide it from of who I was pre Christ. Um, We brought them up in church, um, not only in Connecticut and New York, but moving down here, they're members of Christ fellowship. They were plugged into not only the children's church, but to ministry, you know, ministry trips and everything else from, from start to finish. Um, these kids are brought up around the Lord. They know their pastor, pastor, you know, my son, Jack got into, you know, a little bit of faith questioning relatively recently, like about a year, year and a half ago. And pastor Todd, you know, latched onto him and prayed for him. And, you know, we, we surround, I've surrounded, I've surrounded my kids with the church of Jesus Christ. And not only that, I put him in King's Academy Christian school. So I surrounded him there. I made sure that I gave them the best shot. And now they're now two of them are in Christian colleges. My son loves to play baseball. I'm going to let him do his thing. You know, I'm not, you know, but, but, but he's even, you know, he goes away and he's, you know, plugged into Bible studies and everything. I'm just, just making sure that they're surrounded by believers and, uh, and they're constantly getting the truth of the word of God. Cause believe me, as you know, out there, there's, there's another, there's another so-called, there's, definitely. there's another so-called message that's uh, being preached. Absolutely. And I think what I'm so mm-hmm. impressed by with you, um, is your leadership in the promoting of Jesus Christ. It, the business stuff, I'm so, you know, I get it. You're a yeah. successful businessman. But even today, before your interview, when you called me, you said, before we do the interview, I'm going to go by the hospital, I'm, you know, to yeah. speak with, um, to go pray on Todd. Mm-hmm. For the level of success that you have and everything else you have going for yourself, your commitment to what Jesus has done for you inspired me in ways that like no other. Cause I know what it feels to be obedient and I question myself and I, I question myself. I don't question Jesus. I question myself on, man, do I really have to? Like, and he's delivered every time for me. And I'm inspired by how you serve Jesus, how you impact. And for me to watch you, your children, like I've, I was in a prayer call with you. When COVID happened, we were praying and you had your son there sitting right next to you. I was like, this guy figured it out. Well, you know what? It's, it's all Christ, right? So 
pre pre Christ, I was a total mess and maybe I get some things right. It's only because the spirit of God is on me. And then, and when I follow that, it looks good. Sometimes I don't, and it doesn't look good. Um, but I try to do it as I try to do it as much as best I can, as, as much as I can. Um, but I, I do believe that, um, that obedience is critical to, to being able to keep myself in check. One of the things that type A is like you and I, um, we have a habit of running with things and then we have to, at least me, I'll admit this, I have to deal with a bit of an ego sometimes. And that ego is I'm, I'm this, I'm right. I'm and there are too many eyes in the sentence. And you know, that's, yeah. and then that's God looking down at you and saying, what is that old John coming out again? And, and I have to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I, you know, I was I blessed early. That. I was blessed pretty early with people that was able to tell me never take myself too seriously. <laughs> I was the first thing. My father hum- humbles me down every chance I get to tell him <laughs> what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. sit back down. Then I have a lot of great people that has been around me to actually tell me often, like, you know, the importance of what I'm doing and how I need to do it and always be obedient. I, like I said, I'm around a lot of great men, but the people that inspire me the most is the people that have their faith as big as yourself. You know, the business thing, I think, I have it. I know what I want. I know the level yeah. of success that I want. But I'm always, I, I, and I'm speaking this out loud because I really, I'm more and more, I get excited of people that have a belief system that is so incredibly, like, it's unmatched. And because I know the feeling, because nothing I have is because of what I did. Yeah. What? Yeah. When, when he, when he shows up like he has in my life, and I've given you, you know, just a few examples, like, what a, what a choice do I have? Just like, you know what I'm saying? He's just, he just shows up, shows off. He shows off. He shows Ooh. off. I give away money and like. You get it like back. Four days later, it just shows up as a, in a check in the mail. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And it happens every time. I used to always say the cheat code that I have is the more I give, the more I get. So I'm going to keep on giving. That's my cheat code for everything. It is. It's a real thing. It, it is such a real thing. And it, it you know, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I'll do a real estate deal and, you know, it's people like, oh, yeah, I, I just took down this property for 12 million or I just did this. I just did that. And people are just like, what? How do you come up with all this money? And I'm just, Jesus. Jesus. That's the answer. Just trust it. You know, he'll give you the wisdom and, you know, alpha, like I said, alpha omega, beginning of the end. What, do we, what, what choice do I have? And, and you look just that jail cell. What was the worst moment of my life became the best. He had to break me down. He had to break that man down, that proud, despicable person and mm-hmm. turn that person into um, someone who um, who could be worked with. Right. That's, that's Absolutely. all he wants us to do. He wants us to be his hands and feet. And if we're, we got pride, we got pride. We can't, we, he can't use us. Mm-hmm. Well, John, I'm telling you, brother, what I'm going to do for you. Thank you for, for sharing your testimony. And I already know who you owe that favor to. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna get you before the year is out a shirt that says nine. The nine days you never want to go back to ever in your life again. <laughs> so that's my Christmas holiday gift for you, my brother. Thank like you. It. Thank you for course, everything brother. you've done, man. And so much more, man. Thank that's, you. God bless. Good night. Thank you, John. Wow. <laughs>